Hello, um, again, this is Rajan Dravel. I welcome you all for the fourth session of the Bipsa Education webinar series. I'm glad that uh, Professor Adarshi Madhavi has uh, agreed to offer this webinar based on chapter. Um, we will have around 35, 40 minutes of uh, presentation lecture by a professor and which would be followed by question answer sessions. Uh, those who wants to ask question, I request them to send me a question on the chat message. Uh, I will be moderating the sessions uh, for the question and answers. Uh, I'll request Professor to start his presentation. Adarshir, uh, are you set and can I make you presenter? Okay. Yes, you need to accept the screen. Yes, I can see your screen, Adesh. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rajan. Uh, thanks for all of you. I don't know if I should say good morning or good evening. Uh, it must be a broad geographic distribution. I'm uh, very happy to have the opportunity to share with you some thoughts about one of the chapters in the uh, book that I uh, authored some time ago, and uh, there has been quite a lot of development in this area. But fortunately, when I was looking at the content of the chapter before this webinar, I noticed that uh, most of the basic uh, content uh, applies as well. So without further ado, I want to go through some of the uh, main uh, subjects that, that are of interest and discuss them briefly with you and also maybe report some of the more recent activities that is going on in this area. We all know people have a lot of interfaces with the act of building performance simulations. Uh, some of us develop uh, such uh, simulation tools Many of us use those tools on a regular basis uh, and provide input for the clients. And the people are also the source of definition of requirements for the architectural performance. If you think about uh, when you are simulating the energy performance of a building, the thermal performance of a building, anytime you make certain assumptions about what are the preferable set points, what temperatures are required, what should be the indoor environmental conditions, you're implicitly or explicitly refer to what you think is what the people require. Uh, those are all, so to speak, important uh, areas where the people play a role in the process of building performance simulation. However, the chapter and also my presentation today is more specific. It's specifically addressed as the people as modeled entities in building performance simulation. So the idea is what are the typical ways we represent people in our simulation models? What are the uh, conventions in this area? What are the developments that are ongoing? And is there, so to speak, preferable ways to do that? And also some of the challenges in that area. If you compare various aspects of buildings that are subject to modeling, I have here, so to speak, four basic areas that I distinguish You represent for instance, the building fabric, the basic architectural entity, uh, the building envelope. But you also have certain environmental system depending on the location and the nature of the buildings for heating and cooling and ventilation and the lighting. You model obviously the external boundary conditions, you the weather conditions, solar radiation and uh, all of those uh, issues that have an impact on buildings performance. And last but not least, we need also to model the presence of people and in case they have degrees of freedom to interact with buildings, environmental systems, we need to somehow represent those as well. And all of those input assumptions, if you want, are then fed into some algorithmic uh, system in the building performance simulation, then in turn it generates the values of certain performance indicators. And then you use in order to evaluate the performance of the building or make adjustments or do kinetic 
analysis and so on and so forth. Whereas I think we have fairly a good idea of how to represent the building fabric, the building construction, its specification, also the building systems, there are different possibilities, different levels of resolution, and also the, so to speak, conventions of representing the external boundary conditions, for instance, in terms of time series of temperature and solar radiation and wind speed as they are captured by weather files that we uh, use in building performance simulation regularly, it seems to me that those factors, those input variables are fairly well understood. Of course, we always find better ways, a more advanced way to represent those, especially in the era of building systems. But nonetheless, I think in principle, we have a good understanding of how to approach those uh, input assumptions with regard to building performance simulations. The representations of buildings users occupants, inhabitants, if you want, seems to have been a, a lesser uh, issue in terms of uh, the research. Only relative recently we have started to look more uh, in depth into the ramifications of different ways of trying to represent people's presence and actions in buildings. And that's something that uh, the book chapter, my current presentation, and much research, ongoing research, are, are trying to address. Now, uh, in the book chapter, I suggested that there is a very broad level uh, possibility of distinguishing between people's passive effects and active effects on buildings' uh, performance, on buildings' behavior. And with passive effects, I meant, to, uh, I meant those effects that occur by the virtue of people simply being present in a building. As you know, people emit uh, thermal energy, thermal heat, moisture, there are, uh, productions of uh, pollutants, and so on and so forth. So those issues have to be accounted for and based on our understanding of uh, uh, human uh, biology and physiology and uh, a host of measurements and studies that have been conducted in, in those areas, we have certain, so to speak, repositories of data and we can make those assumptions uh, at different levels of resolution in order to, so to speak, equip our input models for building performance simulations. But people not only, so to speak, passively are present or move around the building, but they also engage, depending on the nature of, of the building, in certain interactions with uh, buildings, control systems, environmental systems, uh, electrical equipment, and so on. And those interactions also uh, obviously affect uh, buildings' uh, performance. Classical examples of operation of uh, luminaires, operation of shading devices, opening and closing the windows, or manipulating the set points of the uh, heating and cooling and ventilation systems of buildings. So we need, so to speak, in the course of providing, preparing the input model for a building simulation analysis, we need to represent, capture, both of these type of effects. Here I have in this uh, slide a simple examples from the literature how these passive effects are typically captured. For example, the heat uh, emission by occupants is captured in terms of people's activity and how many people are in the room. And we uh, distinguish between sensible and latent uh, production of heat, and similar uh, approaches are also used in order, for example, to consider the production of water vapor or carbon dioxide and other uh, uh, pollutants and other ingredients, for example, of the indoor air. To the right side of this slide, you see a graph that shows from a totally different field. In this case, it's about room acoustics. You see, in this case, the uh, reverberation time measured in the famous Berliner Philharmonie, which is a concert hall in Berlin. And you see that uh, the uh, depiction of the reverberation time measured in this room under empty conditions and under occupied conditions. And that shows, for instance, the uh, effect of the people, in this case, on room acoustics. And that's something that, for example, acousticians who are uh, expected to provide preferable acoustical conditions in such a performance uh, hall needs to address. Now, 
if you reflect about what are the typical ways that we uh, capture uh, human-related features in our uh, simulation models, there are certain examples without, you know, trying to be exhaustive. I mentioned some of the ones that uh, many of you are familiar with. Of course, the simplest uh, formalisms that we are familiar for instance, people's presence in the building in terms of uh, schedules, or as sometimes referred to diversity profiles. So the idea is that you get certain aggregate functions, time series, and the idea is that we can uh, assume that certain percentage of, of the people are, will be present in an office building, uh, for instance, during the weekdays or during the weekends. And in the simulation program, that is, so to speak, executing uh, these time series in terms of intervals, those uh, assumptions are reflected, they are translated uh, into internal gains, and uh, uh, likewise, they are uh, taken into account for uh, modeling people's, for instance, passive impact on the overall thermal performance. A similar schedule uh, can also be applied to uh, other um, areas, and they can also be accompanied by definition of simple rule-based methods in order to depict people's interactions with environment. familiar with cases where we model, for example, the operation of window based on simple rules. Uh, there are simple uh, implicit assumptions that, for instance, people uh, have a tendency to operate the windows, we assume, based on certain thermal conditions or with relationship to indoor air quality and we assume certain thresholds, for instance, with regard to either indoor or outdoor temperature. And when those thresholds are reached, we assume that uh, people will uh, operate the windows. So those simple rule-based methods are quite common in uh, simulation input models. More recently, obviously, we also have been making use of the possibility to uh, instead of, so to speak, fixed schedules uh, and these type of rule-based models, also to consider the, pros the possibility of representing both presence of people and their actions in terms of probabilistic methods. So the idea is, in this case, that if you observe the performance of real buildings, obviously you notice that the people don't enter and exit buildings like in an army, uh, the, 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 these processes are, uh, have a random look to them to a certain degree. That means that you have a certain idea of what are the general tendencies. Uh, you hope that the people who design or run these buildings have those basic information about the, the basic tendencies, but you're also aware that in order to have a more realistic depiction of these tendencies, it may be preferable, preferable not to represent them as fixed percentages or fixed frequencies, but uh, represent them in terms of probability-based assumptions. That would mean that if you run, for example, a simulation program multiple times, based on the embedded random nature of these probabilistic models, you would get different results. Typically, these results then, uh, if uh, made by repeating the simulation, for example, using the Monte Carlo uh, method, in aggregate, they would uh, reproduce those tendencies that you assume at the outset, but individual simulation runs would give you uh, different results that uh, would, in a sense, you could argue would be a more uh, realistic representation of what's going on in the building. Well, that, I think, is an important issue and a, a possible improvement of the realistic appeal of the simulation result, one has to be careful. This is something that in a number of discussions in this area has been raised. Uh, one, I believe, has to be careful that uh, the applications of different models for the purpose of representing uh, people in the building performance simulation models might have different uh, reasoning behind that and different intentions and might be also appropriate to be done in different ways according to the type of questions that you are interested in answering by running a, a simulation 
uh, tool and uh, executing a simulation model. Sometimes people talk about fixed schedules in terms of deterministic uh, models. I do not think that that, uh, so to speak, uh, expression is quite accurate in the sense that the word deterministic has a number of, if you want, philosophical ramifications. Usually the people that talk about deterministic processes or the deterministic models, if you think about Pierre Simon Laplace or, or some of the ideas coming from the 19th century, the idea was that the, if you at a certain point in time have all the relevant information about the system in detail, then you could predict it accurately and absolutely correctly for an infinite uh, uh, number of time intervals ahead. Obviously, when we talk about uh, assume building schedule in simulation models, we don't mean it that way. We just simply mean that there are some fixed assumptions. So I uh, personally prefer to talk about schedules rather than uh, deterministic models. But that's not per se a very important issue. That's more of a semantic issue. More importantly is the idea to understand that why the people's behavior and its uh, nature can affect uh, the building, the argument that if you see differences in performance of similar buildings, that is solely and mainly due to the difference in how people act and behave in the buildings, I don't think that that inference is uh, logically accounted for and is not necessarily correct. There are multiple sources of uncertainty when you try to uh, model the behavior of a building and replicate that behavior virtually. Those are uncertainties with regard to uh, assumptions to building construction, building system, climate, and one of the sources of uncertainty is obviously uh, the behavior of people as agents and, and their presence and actions in the buildings. So I think uh, we have to be careful and we have to understand that by the virtue of using a certain type of mathematical formalism for modeling, it doesn't mean that we are necessarily are in a position to provide more accurate predictions of building performance. So those are two different logical categories that we have to, so to speak, carefully uh, take into consideration. In order maybe to discuss this point a little bit more in detail, uh, we have been engaging in some studies where we, we try to understand what type of models predictive models of people's presence and actions would suit what kind of queries in a more uh, appropriate way. And in one of those studies, for example, we looked at different ways of uh, predicting people's presence in a building. In our case, it was an office building. And the application case, it was short-term predictions, let's say for 24 or 48 hours. We wanted to know if we observe uh, for multiple days the patterns of presence of occupants in a building, would we be able to predict the, the, what would happen in the next few days using different models? The purpose also in this case was model-based predictive control. We wanted to, to do that not for an entire year, but just for a few days uh, in, in order to be able to optimize the operation of building systems in the loading of its thermal mass and some such issues. So in order to address the difference between different modeling approaches, we looked at the uh, two uh, uh, probabilistic models that are well documented in the literature, the model by Reinhardt and Page et al. And we also uh, developed a non-probabilistic simple model, which is documented in the publication. And we said, OK, let's look at actual existing empirical data. Let's use all these models and try to replicate this empirical data, which was the presence patterns of uh, uh, people uh, working in a university building. And uh, I show you just uh, the indicators that we use in order to evaluate the performance of these models. Now, this is an important issue because if you want to uh, evaluate if you want to judge how good a model is performing in terms of the prediction or reproduction of patterns of user presence and behavior in buildings, you need to have certain indicators. In the scientific community, there are instances of those indicators, but we haven't done a very good job in 
coming with a, so to speak, very neat and definitive ontology of some indicators. So in this study, we uh, use the literature and some of our own ideas to set up a number of indicators. You see them in this slide. So we say, what will be the errors of this model in order to predict the first arrival time in the office or the last departure time from the office? Or the errors in predictions, what is the occupancy duration every day? Or what is the occupancy state matching? That means how good are we to predict that the people will be there in a certain time interval versus uh, coming up with a mistaken prediction of that uh, state? And also a number of transitions error. That means how many times people leave the office and come back? Uh, how good are we in predicting those patterns? So we look at all of those indicators, and uh, in this next slide, you see community distribution functions to summarize the performance of these models. On the left, as an instance, you see the occupancy duration error prediction errors and the state matching errors are on the right side. And as you see, somewhat surprisingly, it is simpler. Uh, Non-probabilistic model is performing somewhat better in this case than the two uh, aforementioned stochastic models. If you reflect about that, you might well uh, maybe come to the conclusion that in this case, because we are talking about short-term predictions, maybe the non-stochastic model is more oriented towards the general tendency of the data, towards the mean values, and hence performs a uh, somewhat better than stochastic models that have a wider dispersion by nature. So the, the point that we are making in this type of studies is that one needs to look at the level of fitness of the model that one is using, the, so to speak, formalism that one is using, and the type of questions that uh, is, are, are meant to be answered. Let me give you another example. In this case, we are talking about the plug loads. That means the electrical energy used due to the uh, operation of the equipment by occupants, by inhabitants of the buildings. I'm talking again about office buildings, so imagine office workers have electrical equipment, computers, uh, printers, and those type of equipment are operated by the occupants. Uh, so in this case, uh, especially in the office buildings, they play a significant role. So we wanted to uh, see if we can uh, predict the intensity, uh, the rate, the power usage of such equipment based on some simple pieces of information. For example, if you have some ideas about people's presence patterns, when they show up in the office, how long they stay there, and when they leave. And if you have some ideas about the total installed equipment power, that means what technical equipment is at the disposal and what are the, so to speak, declared uh, installed power of those equipment. So we did some empirical studies in a number of uh, workstations, uh, again in the university buildings, and then we figured out that, for example, there's a kind of a neat relationship between the presence probability of the occupants and the plot load fraction. The plot load fraction uh, denotes in, in this context the fraction of the installed power that is at a certain time uh, interval is being actually used. And those simple uh, empirically driven functions can be uh, the core of a, so to speak, initial very simple predictive model of the resulting office equipment power usage in an office building. Well, we wanted also to look at this from, again, a probabilistic point of view, because, again, we understand that while this uh, simplified model uh, have the potential to predict those type of power usage in an aggregate fashion. The realistic uh, viewing of such uh, power usage is much more fluctuating and is much more random. So we said maybe we should uh, also look at a formalism that addresses that point. In this specific case, why will these solutions were used? And we made some distinct distinctions between uh, presence uh, periods, uh, the, uh, so to speak, working hours, uh, outside working hours, and also during breaks that were shorter than one hours. 
Also in this case, we look at these two modeling approaches and then we uh, compare them with the empirical results. And here I show you both for annual plug loads and later on for peak plug loads, a comparison of measured values. Here in this uh, slide, uh, you see them in terms of blue bars. Uh, some very simplified uh, predictions based on uh, standard hash rate data. Uh, the simplified method is the green bars and the purple bar shows the results of the stochastic model. As you see, we compared the predictions and the uh, modeling results, sorry, the modeling results and the measurements for the years 2003 and 2015 in this office. The models themselves were developed based on the data in 2014. So whenever you develop a model and you, you try to verify that, it's very important that you use different data sets for model development and model verification, because otherwise what you're doing is really not a model verification, but curve fitting. So in this case, we, we try to do that in a proper way. So as you see, in this case, again, the simplified model seems to be performing very well in terms of predicting the annual plot loads in this office area. But if you look at a different indicator, in this case, the peak plot loads, which might be also for certain applications of importance. So uh, the, the plot loads, in order to understand what kind of loads the entire system is experiencing, is significant. In this case, it was, uh, interestingly, the hash rate, which has, so to speak, its uh, basic uh, uh, data on a, on a safe side, so to speak, and has been exaggerating, is actually coming very close to the peak load, and also the stochastic formalism provides much better approximations of the actual peak plot loads than the simplified uh, method. So the simplified method in this case is, so to speak, blind to the dispersion, the fluctuation of the results, and hence the, uh, the uh, results are much less reliable in this case. So this differentiated view is something that we as developers and users of simulation tools have to be sensitive to. Let me now use maybe another example uh, from a different domain. In this case, we're talking about window operation to go a little more deeper into what I think might be the uh, approach to the core of the problem. And I see the core of the problem that our modeling approaches currently are mostly based on data that we collect. Researchers develop uh, models based on the data that they can get their hands on. Usually this data is uh, from a limited number of buildings or, or spaces and so on by nature. It is not trivial to get a lot of observational data that allow for you to uh, judge the uh, behavior uh, of people in buildings or various reasons for that. I will uh, not be able to cover all of those reasons or technical reasons uh, how do you collect that data. There are privacy issues so the people will have to agree that you can collect such data and, and process that in many countries, in many offices, the people will have problems with that. Uh, you, it's very difficult to do experimental studies, get people uh, in, in certain time and just uh, try to, to under control conditions, see how they behave. Because of all those reasons, it's quite difficult, expensive, time consuming uh, to uh, accumulate a lot of empirical data. It would be nice if we had a lot of those data, but fact of the matter is that there is a bit of a paucity of uh, reliable high resolution long term data and also in different areas, different countries, different types of offices. And because of those reasons, developers are more or less are forced to actually work with a limited set of data. And if you take that data and in terms of developing, let's say, a black box model and a gray, a gray box model, uh, it becomes quite a challenge to identify the signals that correlate people's behavior with something that you can logically define and consider in the course of uh, creating a building performance model. Now let me be a bit more specific by giving you a, the example of window operation. So if we talk about window operation, we did a study in some of our own uh, offices which we have been uh, observing because we installed a fairly high resolution, very detailed monitoring infrastructure in these office buildings. 
And for a number of years, we observed things like people's presence and their operation of uh, luminaires and windows and how they changed the uh, settings of the radiators in these buildings. And amongst other things, obviously, we're also observing how the windows are operated. The building is naturally ventilated, so the window operation is the main uh, mode of uh, providing fresh air to the indoor uh, environment. So we were looking in this case and coming with some, if you want, hypothesis of uh, what motivates people to engage in this type of uh, uh, operation behaviors. For example, we looked at the hypothesis that if people arrive in an office, the probability of uh, the inhabitant opening the window might be a function of the deviation from the indoor temperature that they find in the working place to their comfort temperature, whichever will be defined. Imagine we use adaptive theory or some such theory in order to say, for this population, probably uh, this indoor environment would be a desirable. And when we look at the data in this case, these are based on uh, multiple years of data collection, you see, yes, there is a general tendency that seems to be saying, yeah, if the deviation of the indoor temperatures from the desirable temperatures uh, increase, maybe also the likelihood of people engaging in operating the window increase. Likewise, we look at the occupancy period. In this case, we're not talking about first arrivals, but we're talking about uh, generally people sitting in the office and then engage in this action of opening the window uh, or, or closing. And in this case, we find the signal is even weaker. So there is a signal, uh, if you want, but this signal is submerged in a kind of noise, which I postulate is because of a number of issues. That might be because people are different from each other, that even the same individual might have different conditions with regard to their health or, or current conditions. And because of that, the predictability of those type of actions uh, becomes a, a difficult problem of having high enough signal to noise ratios. We look at that also in terms of another hypothesis. We're saying, okay, Maybe uh, people's uh, operation of windows has to do with the air quality, and if we take the carbon dioxide concentration as a very, so to speak, simple indicator of air quality, let's look at that. And in case of intermediate arrivals, that means people already in the office, and they go out and they come back, we see a kind of relationship between the carbon dioxide concentration and uh, the probability of window uh, operation. And if you look at the uh, same question during the occupancy period, we, you almost don't see any correlation. So again, you see the hypothesis that we define in, in those cases are somewhat difficult to uh, uh, convincingly, so to speak, document because of difficulties of detecting signals in the noise of these random conditions that you, you find in terms of the distribution of the people, their states, and their uh, specific needs at a certain point in time. So uh, that to me explains in principles, conceptually, some of the problems that we have in terms of evaluating and verifying some of the existing models that have been suggested in order to uh, provide models of window operation in buildings. In a course of a study, we looked at uh, three uh, uh, stochastic models, typically using Markov chain uh, logistic regression models uh, that you see here, uh, uh, or in the literature well documented. And then we looked also, just to, to speak, have a rounded view, we looked at also some non stochastic rule based uh, assumptions, as I mentioned before, those assumptions are that, uh, okay, if the indoor and outdoor environmental conditions are within or values are within a certain range, the temperatures within the same certain range, that we assume that the windows are open uh, and uh, otherwise not. So we implemented uh, these uh, six, if you want, models and we again conducted simulations and again we com uh, conducted comparisons of the states of the actual measured uh, 
uh, windows uh, versus the predictions uh, calculations done by these uh, approaches. Again, based on the long-term relatively high resolution data. And I show you some of the results of this comparison. First, you see uh, when we look at these uh, six models, this um, graphic shows you again for a number of diff uh, different performance indicators, open state predictions, uh, general state predictions, the fraction of open states, the number of window operation actions, and the median duration of windows being open. These are the, if you want, the performance indicators of these models. And on the y-axis, you see the relative error. It is noteworthy that we had to make this graphic in logarithmic scale, because otherwise we couldn't show the, the errors. So when here it says uh, 1, it means plus minus 10%. And two already means plus minus 100%. And three means plus minus 1,000%. So as you see, if you take these models, the stochastic ones, for example, if you don't do anything with them, if you don't do any adjustments to the data that you have uh, uh, on your own buildings, you might get results that are uh, totally out of bounds in terms of any kind of reliability. Of course, sometimes these models could be somewhat enhanced if you apply certain modifications. For example, certain models do not take into account that you might not be able in an office building to do nighttime ventilation. Obviously, that generates a, a lot of false predictions. So we do some adjustments, and if you do some adjustments, you see that the performance of the models gets somewhat improved. Here in this case, we have uh, smaller errors. But still, the errors are very big in, in large. If you have the possibility, for example, if in your use case, you use the models not to support the design of the building, but you want to optimize its operation. So you have an existing buildings where you have some data, and you can calibrate the model. These type of models usually have certain coefficients. The value of those coefficients can be calibrated according to the data that you have. If you can do something like that, as we see here in the case of C, then the model starts to perform much better, and the mileage that you can get, for example, out of the higher resolution probabilistic models starts to express itself for that type of use case. But as I mentioned before, of course, this use case pertains only to the cases where you have an existing buildings and the model is applied for the enhancement of the operation procedures in the buildings. We also looked at the implications of using these different uh, window operation models in terms of predicting the annual heating demand of uh, this office building. So here you see uh, as benchmark is the actual uh, measured heating demand. And on the right side, you see what would be predictions if we assume the windows are always closed or always open. So the theoretical distance between those assumptions is very big. But in reality, as you see, the uh, reality was much closer to buildings being most of the time closed. Now, if you look at the predictions of the stochastic models with no adjustment whatsoever, the errors can be very large. So we would have to calibrate those stochastic models in order to get uh, preferable results. And even then, we don't see a big difference if you look at some aggregate indicator, like an annual heating demand uh, of buildings, you don't see a major qualitative difference between the predictive, uh, if you want, potential of these type of models. So again, I go back to that point that is a very good idea to think about what are you asking the simulation tool, what are you doing with it, and what kind of models would be appropriate for that. Are you looking at something very, so to speak, broad, you want to provide some kind of a certificate about the overall thermal quality of the building, or if you are a mechanical engineer, for example, that has to very carefully look at the load fluctuations in certain buildings as a function of the occupancy density. In those cases, you might actually want to choose a model that gives you that higher resolution data. So in order to visualize that a little bit, this query space, that means the space of intellectually possible questions that you can ask a simulation tool can be very complicated, multidimensional. You can have simulations at the level of details of buildings components to whole buildings or a campus of buildings or whole districts. You can have different uh, 
stages of the design and building delivery process. It can be an early design or detailed design, or you be already in the building operation. You might be looking at intervals that are very short, sub-hourly, but you might do daily analysis or monthly, or you can look at the whole life cycle of the buildings. You can look at whole building uh, performance indicators or individual floors. You might look at different orientations, or you look at micro zoning, or for example, office buildings. Your purpose of simulation might be to do parametric studies, or creating an energy certificate, or do system sizing, or do HVC control. And you might also be looking at different type of indicators, annual heating demand, or peak heating loads, or thermal comfort related indicators. So as you see, where you are in this uh, conceptual space of possible queries has a major implications for the type, the level of detail, and the technical specification of the type of uh, models that you use in order to represent the occupants. Let me come uh, to a conclusion. I have a few recommendations. I uh, would recommend to uh, users, developers uh, of, of simulation tools, uh, those people who teach those uh, to the uh, students and professional community to consider that we should not confuse simulation with prediction. Most of the time we use simulation to understand the behavior of a building in the design phase to improve the overall behavior but long-term predictions of building performance is, uh, is uh, non-trivial. You could argue, if you just think about the weather conditions, that is also not possible, because beyond a few days, it's not really possible to do that. So that's really not the exact predictions of long-term future performance of buildings. is not really the objective of using performance simulation. As I mentioned before, be careful uh, when you talk about deterministic and you're just talking about fixed diversity profiles. Uh, otherwise, uh, it might be a, a confusion uh, in, in your mind as to what is the nature of a probabilistic model versus using some uh, schedules or diversity uh, profiles. And as I mentioned, just by the virtue of using a specific mathematical formalism, it doesn't mean that just because it is maybe more detailed or mathematically more demanding, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get more accurate results or accurate prediction. That would be a mistaken assumption. Sometimes we use uh, simulation tools or any type of uh, computational tools for uh, generally benchmarking the uh, thermal quality or the performance of a building, but that is different than trying to do energy use predictions. Also, in terms of model development, we should be very careful and we should not talk about a model being validated just uh, if we haven't done any type of comparison with the uh, real measured data, or if you have done a very quick and dirty based on one building or two buildings, those do not establish the validity of a model that has to be uh, used for many different contexts, many different locations, and different types of buildings. In the development, one should be careful, again, as I mentioned, that we shouldn't conflate the data sets that we use for model development and those that we need to use for model evaluation. That is a standard scientific research issue, but again, in our field, because of the paucity of data, scarcity of data, sometimes we see these type of developments that are not appropriate. Also, from a single limited behavioral study, we cannot extrapolate to all kinds of populations and building types and locations and climates. In model development and evaluation, we should be careful not to be, so, so, so to speak, so much in love with our own models that we uh, kind of develop a bias. And it is important that models go through double-blind tests and round-robin tests, if possible, in, in order to get a more objective and broad view of their performance. And when we use these uh, specifically uh, sophisticated uh, models uh, in simulation tools, we have to be very careful about all of these issues. Because it is quite common that inexperienced user may assume just by the virtue of having a sophisticated formalism at their disposal, they're getting a very, uh, so to speak, accurate representations of reality or even can make very uh, accurate predictions. You have to be very careful about those type of assumptions. As I mentioned, the uh, scientific community has been 
uh, very active in the years after the completion of this book chapter. Here I have a bit of a bias myself, if you want, so I have a couple of uh, lists of uh, publications of uh, myself and my group and my colleagues. Uh, but there is a, a broad, very productive, uh, very uh, high quality contributions that are coming almost on a daily basis. So for those of you who are interested in this area, working in this area, or the work in this area is relevant for your uh, educational or professional activities, there is a emerging rich body of different studies. It is, uh, so to speak, important that we work towards a synthesis of this data at some point, such that we have better standards of what kind of models we should recommend uh, professionals to use in what stages of design. I dare to say that we are not there yet, but we are working in that direction, and the progress that is being made is, uh, I think, uh, interesting and valuable. So that was a brief, so to speak, reference to the uh, uh, content uh, of the chapter, not only, but also uh, the work that has been uh, uh, going on, uh, the, the type of research that has been uh, being conducted since then. I hope I uh, provided uh, a sufficiently uh, intelligible overview of this work, and I would be very happy to uh, answer any questions in case you have some. Thank you, Rajan, for uh, hosting this uh, webinar. Thank you, Adeshir. Um, I'm keeping your your screen on the on the broadcast right now. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one from um, Mr. A. D. Cruz. I don't know how to spell that, but uh, it's regarding how to represent uh, certain data. And I am unmuting him. He will introduce he or she will introduce himself and then last a question. Uh, this question will come from A. B. Cruz. Uh, good, good morning, Professor uh, Madhavi. Uh, I'm Aloysius from uh, Aloysius De Cruz from from Malaysia. So the question is regarding the slide title deterministic stochastic fallacy. I think it's one of the first few slides. Um, the, the gra there's a graph that is shown on the right bottom. Uh, I'm wondering um, what are the practical ways to produce such a data? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, I am assuming referring to the graph that shows the fluctuations of the presence of individual office worker in an office. So that graph, uh, which I think is also reproduced in the book chapter itself, represents observational data. We did some years ago a cross-section uh, study in about 200 workstations in office buildings in Austria. And there we observed, so to speak, on a continuous basis, the patterns of presence. And then, very interestingly, obviously, you see that if you look at individual occupants, those presence patterns can be very different day by day and amongst different occupants of the office. So, in other words, there seems to be really no shortcut with regarding uh, to generate the empirical basis of, uh, of such presence patterns. Obviously, once you have a sufficient density of that data, maybe for a specific, if you want, demographic group or office worker in certain types of office in, in, in a certain country, if you have a sufficient density, then you can use those data either to create aggregate models like the diversity profiles that, for example, you see in various standards, or you can use them in order to uh, provide the basis for probabilistic models that use that basic tendencies, but then they can emulate realistic day-by-day -day, uh, presence uh, patterns of individual occupants. But at the end of the day, my, so to speak, credo is that without reliable uh, and um, detailed empirical data, uh, everything that we uh, produce is more or less a speculation. Uh, in many cases, especially for design professionals or uh, simulation experts that support uh, the design of building is a bit of a problem, obviously, 
because in many cases in the design process you don't know exactly the nature of the occupancy. In, in, if you're lucky, you know, okay, what kind of corporation, what kind of uh, community will be using the building and maybe you will be able to get some reliable data about basic patterns. But in a lot of cases, uh, you would need to make certain assumptions and in those cases, if you do a probabilistic uh, augmentation of that data, it's not because you want to get a better, uh, let's say, representation of that specific buildings in terms of the occupancy patterns, but you just do that if, in my opinion, in terms of uncertainty analysis, you say, I would like to know if my basic assumption is perturbated by the fact that it might be a bit more or less and so on and so forth. Does it have implications for the type of indicators that I'm going to calculate or not? I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Adashir. We have one more question, but before I pass on uh, the, the speaker or microphone to uh, Prashad Vaidya who wants to ask question, can I request you to uh, keep the slide of uh, recommended reading on the screen? Uh, some of the people wants to note down uh, what are the papers which uh, you are you were recommending. So can you just uh, slide back? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I am uh, requesting Prashad. I'm unmuting him. Uh, he wished to ask one question. Uh, just a minute. Prashad? Hello, Prashad. Hello. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Hello, Professor Madhvi. Thank you for the presentation. Hi. This is Prashad Vaidya uh, calling from Berkeley. I wanted to know if you could provide us some illustrative examples of when it's appropriate to use the stochastic methods for uh, doing the simulation, some sort of simulation end use uh, examples. Okay, well, thank you. That's a uh, good and important question. Um, if you recall, I showed this conceptual space of the query, and that it, it can be it can be quite uh, complicated, but generally speaking. I think uh, the, the uh, use of probabilistic methods are always interesting and also useful in case you want to explore the implication of a certain uh, levels of uncertainty of the data at your disposal on the results of the specific performance indicators that you look at. I don't have really an absolute answer for that question, but I can distinguish between general groups of queries. For instance, we have figured out that if your queries are looking at some aggregate measures of performance, let's say if you're looking at the annual heating demand uh, of a building, so classical, so to speak, performance indicators that result from the simulation runs or annual cooling demands and so on. Those type of more aggregated uh, performance indicators, especially aggregated, that means the entire building maybe is taken into account, and also temporally aggregated, which means maybe a whole year, 8,000 uh, one hour time interval is processed into that data. It seemed to me that based on our experiences so far, it is not a major issue or so to speak, the, the difference between using uh, some schedules or using uh, Monte Carlo simulation based on numerous, so to speak, simulation rounds, it does not seem to make a major difference. And the interpretation of the result is not, so to speak, further facilitated or improved by doing that. But if you look at certain situations where both the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution is high, for example, you're looking, you're, as, a, as a mechanical engineer, you're looking at the load requirements of a meeting room, or in an institutional building, you're talking about lecture rooms and so on and so forth. And you're looking also at a spatial, so to speak, segment of the building, which is very specific, and you're looking at the possibility of identifying the type, the, the type of 10, per, 10 percentage or 5 percentile uh, peak loads that might occur in a building or ventilation requirements and those type of analysis. In those cases, I think it becomes probably more relevant and perhaps more important 
to do a more detailed analysis in which you say, okay, I need to subject my assumptions into some perturbation and I need to look at, uh, so to speak, different uh, conditions that may occur and I need to take that into consideration in this uh, process. So that is one axis, if you want, to say, okay, the models that are more aggregate level are also probably more suitable for those type of high level aggregate performance uh, indicators and so on. The other thing that in the course of our studies we observed is that if you maybe look at very short term uh, performance based on past observations, maybe in this case uh, I mentioned in the course of the presentation model predictive controls that in those cases uh, maybe, and uh, it's not very intuitive, but maybe a uh, non-probabilistic model sticks more closely to the general pattern of the data and maybe provide uh, more, more reliable data. One uh, related point, uh, in many of our studies we figured out that the, in terms of the fidelity of your conclusion for a simulation run with regard to uh, the people's uh, role, the presence and action is much more important for the simulation expert to have an idea of what is going on. So to having real data or realistic data, for example, what is the nature of this company or what will be the building user is more important than the, the type of modeling formalism that you apply. You, you can have the best, most sophisticated probabilistic model, but if your starting point in terms of your underlying assumptions are far from what actually will then occur in that building, it all will not help you a lot in, um, in predicting or in reproducing the, uh, the performance of that building. Again, I hope that goes some way to address uh, your question. Thank you, that was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Adarshid, can you go back one slide? There's somebody uh, who wants to refer your recommendation, those 10 recommendations which you gave. Um, what should, when to really refer to this thing? The, Yes, this is the one, the nine, nine recommendations. Uh, so that, that is somebody wanted to refer this and we uh, have only two questions which you have already answered. So we are just at the ending uh, uh, webinar now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for joining the webinar. Next webinar would be uh, in this third week of November. Uh, we'll announce that well in advance. And I again thank you, uh, Professor Radhashir for providing such a wonderful webinar to IBIPSA. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.